Okay, so happy new year, everybody. Um, so just uh, three lectures left. Um, so today is uh, uh, we're just going to start um, considering more than one particle systems of more than one particle, and um, really, you know, we've already seen some. Uh, amazing things that happen with uh, on a quantum scale with quantum particles but today and the next two lectures we're really gonna it, it's really you're really going to see some uh, some um, things that were really that will challenge your uh, you know your intuition what you what you know all right so today the main theme is identical particles in and um, in quantum mechanics so quantum mechanical identical particles We'll also start combining quantum systems, which is what we're going to continue on with for the rest of the semester. So two more, two more lectures after today. The main, uh, the main um, um, reference for today is Shankar chapter ten, and but also Sakurai chapter seven uh, is pretty good. Uh, I'd I'd recommend that. If you're looking for a second opinion or for another explanation of, of uh, anything, then well, one of the books you can turn to is the Cohen, book by Cohen Tanuji et al. But you can also try Sakurai. So I've had students come to me saying that they like Sakurai a lot. Sakurai's style is actually really good. But um, yeah, sometimes um, it's a little bit... Um, it's a, it's a little bit advanced, but it's a little bit uh, piecemeal. So he, he has gaps in the subject matter and the topics that he chooses. But the ones that he does cover, he covers really well, I think. And for the second part of today, uh, it's Suskin 2, chapters 6 and 7, which is also what we, uh, you, know, you can also read that uh, for the rest of the semester, lecture 14 and lecture 15. But it's going to be supplemented as usual. So Shankar chapter 10 is the main, um, main reference for today. So we're looking at systems of two or more identical particles. And first of all, I want to give you just an intuitive idea of uh, the experimental origin of, of the permutation symmetry uh, that a many-body wave function has to have for, uh, for, for two or more identical particles. And you'll see, we'll do a derivation of the two types of permutation symmetry. It's, it's very simple. It's one of several different ways of doing it. Shankar does it a very novel way. I, I quite like it. Um, it avoids, it avoids uh, too much mathematics. It, it um, just gets right to the heart of the matter, I think. Um, Sakurai has a nice one as well, but his is a little, a little bit more mathematical. Um, and then we'll actually look at the Pauli exclusion principle. We'll derive the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay. Well, at least uh, it's not really a proper derivation in the sense of uh, proving things from the grandest possible perspective, but at least you'll see why it arises. Uh, to actually prove it um, really well, you need uh, quantum field theory. Both sonic and fermionic states, normalization of the n body wave function, and a very important, sec very important little section this experimental consequence of identical particles, and this is an interference effect. And um, it's it's completely analogous to the interference you have in a double slip experiment. Because in quantum mechanics, if some process can happen in two or more ways, then you have to add up the complex amplitude for each possible way that it can happen. And that's the same with identical particles. Uh, and it can be just extremely simple sorts of things, just measuring where they are. And you have an interference effect, which means that um, in ways you'll see, some types of particles are more likely to be, uh, but twice as likely to be at certain points, 
and some are completely unlikely to be at certain points. In a, in a box, for example, or in an atom. Very important, very important effect this one. The basis of um, um, many different uh, phenomena in, uh, in physics. There's no way that we're going to do this point today here, the last one, or this last one here. The, uh, the derivation of permutation symmetry and the Pauli exclusion principle using second quantization. I really, really like to do this because it, it's just so simple. Um, but the, the consequences uh, of this, it's really the right way of looking at it of many particle systems. And it's, um, it, it's also, it, it, it's just great. But there's no way I'll have time for it today. And it's not really something you normally do in third year anyway. It's more like a fourth year thing. But any of you going on to uh, um, any kind of theoretical uh, work in uh, a group lab in um, fourth year, you're going to, probably going to be doing quantum field theory, unless you're doing something like astronomy or cosmology. Maybe even in cosmology you'll do it. That's, they do it in um, many universities, quantum field theory, even if you're doing cosmology. Anyway, if you're going on to a theoretical group in fourth year, then I strongly suggest you read Matt Spacher chapter 21 uh, before you start a quantum field theory course. Professor, what is second quantization? Um, it's, um, it's, it's really a reformulation of quantum mechanics and generalization of quantum mechanics to uh, arbitrary number of particles where the number of particles can change. And the, the, uh, the basic um, I guess notational idea is that uh, the, the basis kets are defined in terms of the occupation of states. So occupation of state number one, number of particles occupy number state number one, number two, number three, etc. Uh, and that's that's the that's the proper way of looking at many body systems, as you will see in, in statistical mechanics. Um, first lecture next semester. Yeah. So, in fact, um, one of the things that Metz Bacher does here is derive the grand canonical partition function straight from the second quantization notation. And it's very nice, works out very nicely. Um, I'm sorely tempted to do this like first lecture next semester in SV3. Uh, it's just that there may be people who are just coming into SP3, um, like you pay students, who have not sat SP2, so they'll be hit with like, second quantization, not the second quantization in the first lecture, and they'll be pretty blown away. But I might do it anyway. Um, I'll just see, see how, how we're going for time. The lecture might end up being a little bit longer, but it's very well worth it. So that's the main point for today. And the rest is um, combining quantum systems. Today, I just want to go through some basics. It's essentially just the rest of Shankar chapter 10. And um, it's really, today I'll just be doing some notation. Basically, it's a notational exercise, defining notation and seeing how the me um, mechanism works, how, how to deal with the notation. So that's that. And next week, in the next two lectures, we'll go into this in more physical um, detail, more, de more depth, more physical depth. So the main character for today is this guy here. Um, and um, he looks like the guy from, uh, I don't know if you've seen um, The Maltese Falcon, it's a famous film from, a, uh, from black and white film from decades ago, he looks like, he looks like <laughs> the guy who's uh, one, of the, one of the crooks who, uh, who steals, I think he steals the Maltese Falcon or something like that. Isn't it? <laughs> anyway, that's Wolfgang Pauli. And uh, I really like these two quotes from him. Um, a famous one that's, um, that's repeated over and over again, and slightly modified every time you hear it. That is not only not correct, it's not even wrong. Uh, so actually, to be wrong, you have to actually be saying something that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, 
So, uh, so even with uh, one particle systems, we've seen some pretty amazing quantum effects, such as wave particle duality um, and the non-existence of the concept of a path of a particle, at least uh, if it's not not massive or moving slowly enough. But when you start considering two or more particles, then this quantum weirdness, or um, and in fact spookiness, which is, is spookhaft, is, is the word that um, Einstein used, um, comes out very even more strongly. Um, and it's the contrast with our classical intuition is even greater. And it goes for even seemingly simple experiments like the scattering of, of identical particles. So when identical particles scatter, compared to, I mean, on a quantum scale, the ones with, um, that are going to the De, De Broglie wavelength is, is long enough, um, then, then certain scattering into certain directions can be enhanced or suppressed compared to the classical case. The energy levels of a helium atom are altered because of what's called the exchange force. Exchange force is just uh, an, uh, a manifestation of the power exclusion principle. Just electrons uh, avoid certain certain regions in the atom, and so the, they become more concentrated in other regions, or the molecule or the crystal, they become more concentrated in other regions, so the electric charge is greater, so there's a greater repulsion, so there's a greater energy stored in, in that, um, in per, per volume in that, in that region. So, um, so that, that's a direct consequence of the exchange force. Magnetism as well. Uh, you can read even the, the Wikipedia article on ferromagnetism, which we'll look at um, in SP3 next semester. Uh, ferromagnetism really depends on the exchange force and the Pauli exclusion principle to work. Um, but also effects that challenge your conception of reality. You know, like special relativity really challenges you. So rigid objects actually appearing shorter if they're moving past you. Um, or even actually being shorter because you can measure them to be shorter not just appearing shorter, um, but really the whole concept of reality, of locality and causality, uh, really, um, you know, um, seems to be challenged by even as little as two particles, which is something we'll look at next, the next lecture and the lecture after, not today. So that's, that's part of entanglement. And this has real applications, in fact, in quantum computing. So quantum computation relies on the sort of thing that uh, we're going to start seeing later today. Um, well, to put it in a nutshell, or what's the simplest, grandest possible picture? It's, uh, well, the mathematical representation of quantum mechanics, or in other words, of reality, really gives us a hint of uh, what's, what's to be expected or why uh, we're going to see some extremely strange things happening. Uh, because experimental quantities, time, the dynamic dynamical variables, are not functions of phase space coordinates as they are in, in the classical limit, but they're encoded in the wave function psi. So the wave function contains all the information about the system. But this wave function de describes all the particles at once. It's like the fundamental relation. It's, yeah, yeah. In, in fact, um, uh, in a couple of weeks. See, we're very lucky to be doing, you're, you're very lucky to be doing statistical mechanics in third year at the same time as this level of quantum mechanics. Because it means that in comparison to 
I don't know, some large percentage of universities, you're able to access or understand things much better at a much better level. So you're going to see the, how quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics just intertwine. They're really basically the same subject. Um, and you're going to see that, in fact, um, well, it's not the wave function that's important, but the, what's called the density matrix. And the density um, distribution in classical statistical mechanics, the density matrix in quantum mechanics and quantum statistical mechanics um, are the quantities that really define a lot of things that we need. But the wave function is, um, is at, the, at the heart of all that. So it describes all the particles at once. And it's also de defined on the entire experimental apparatus at the same time. Right? So in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which is what we're doing, every, every point of the entire apparatus is described at the same instant by the wave function. Whether the apparatus is something very small in your laboratory, or whether it's spread out over many buildings, or something the size of the Large Hadron Collider, or the size of the solar system, or the galaxy, or even the universe. So that's, that's one of the sources of the amazing things, the incredible things that that happen on a quantum scale with two or more particles. Now this next one, you cannot know anything more about a particle, it's a, I'm talking about a particle in the quantum mechanical limit, than a complete set of commuting observables. That means, for example, you can't do something like paint a particle, a particular colour, your favourite colour, and follow it. In, a, in an apparatus, because painting a colour does not correspond to an observable. Um, maybe it's possible to label the atom using some, maybe some other particle, maybe put an extra electron on it, but then you've changed the, changed the system. It's not an identical particle. It's not identical to all the other particles anymore. So there's no way to make an identical particle non-identical? Um, well, there is. The particle can decay into some, oh, okay. some other things, yeah? Mm -hmm. Or it can, uh, yeah. So, um, or, yes, yeah, so, or some, or um, in a nucleus, there could be some kind of nuclear decay it could transform to another type of atom. Um, yeah, so it can, yeah. But then, then, then the system has changed. And you need a new wave function yeah, to describe it. Um, you can't follow the trajectory inside the apparatus because following a trajectory means constantly making measurements that, and, and measurements change everything. Yeah. So, and when the particle is left alone, the uncertainty in position will grow over time. And one very important point, and it's one of the unifying points um, of a lot of the um, effects that you see in quantum mechanics uh, in terms of what the wave function must look like and the way it transforms under certain uh, transformations is that the modulus squared of the wave function is the probability or probability density of measuring some mini body light value or measuring that the system is in some state. So, for example, if you ignore spin um, temporarily, if, uh, if psi is expressed in the x basis, then the modulus, modulus of psi squared is the probability of finding the particles in some infinitesimal cube located at some point in space or configuration space. But this thing here has, uh, uh, it's essentially the Cobrin Hagen interpretation. But this is, uh, I mean, it's, it, 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 it is what experiments um, show, what experiments um, 
and it's expect to see. How did you find all the white pills? Um, it depends on what you're, um, how you're measuring it. But if you're if you're making a measurement on all the particles at the same time, then yeah, this would be the probability of finding particle one at, over here, particle two over here, particle three over so here. What do you see? What do you configuration? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's if you measure all the particles at once. Yeah, of course, you can have an apparatus that only measures, say, two particles or three particles out of a few of them. But then our our uh, size would be different. It would be. Uh, it would be uh, the vacuum there for two particles. Yeah. yeah. So it's at, at a point in the configuration space. Yeah. So so yeah. Um, now experimentally, there, there is some there is there is a certain physical, um, like a physical basis for all this. What, what's going on with the identical particles? All the part, all the effects with identical particles. There's, there's a physical reality that's happening. The basic idea is that let's say you just consider two particles, um, and let's say you consider this situation here. Um, well, actually, first of all, suppose you have uh, two particles in localized states. I'll just describe it like this. So there's your there's your box, and and. And you, you prepare two particles in localized states, and for for the time being, well, what if you prepare this particle using using an, this apparatus, and this particle, uh, and this apparatus you use to prepare another particle in a localized state? Well, as long as they're far apart, and as long as you don't wait very long, they they are actually distinguishable because that's not going to the probability uh, distribution for this one is not going to spread out very much and and its momentum is say not so fast going that way and this one let's say is going that way so for a while they're going to be distinguishable simply because they're in different regions of the, of the box but eventually what's going to happen is that their wave functions are going to overlap somewhere in the box so before uh, since we we know we, we haven't taken too long you know that they're independent. Yeah. So basically, in this this is this is a little example here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we can say that we can tell which wave function is where. Yeah. So that's why it's. Yeah. Yeah. It's essentially it's localized enough in the in the box uh, for them to be distinguishable. You know that this apparatus put that particle there. This apparatus put that particle there, and they're not going to be too far away. Even say you know say a few minutes later, depending on. Um, and their many uh, like wave function would be just the sum, the simple sum. Mm, we'll see. But eventually, what's going to happen is that there's going to be some region where the mm -hmm. wave functions overlap. You know what? What happens then? The problem is that when the wave functions overlap, it's like the stuff that it's as if, okay, as if. Now this is a metaphor. Not say, or well, it could be, you could say maybe it's the quantum field. Right? It's it's uh, it's as if the wave function is made of some stuff, and every particle is made of the same stuff. Right? It's as if, okay. And so when the particle, this particle here, um, comes here, and say this particle came from there, right? Now in this region here, the the part, the um, the wave functions overlap. And then when they emerge from that region, it's impossible to tell which particle came from where. Okay? So it's impossible to tell the difference. Suppose that the initial point for the two particles was there and there. And there and there. It's and the final points are here. So you've got a measuring apparatus that measures detector that measures particles there and there, it's impossible to tell which of these two situations actually happened. Because the particles are, are, are uh, have the same work. They're the identical same mass. particles. Identical particles. Yeah. Impossible to tell. So the thing is that it's impossible to tell their past the uniquely you don't know that which particle is, is in this detector 
you don't know where which particle started here once you detect them. If this is all you know. Okay. All right. Um, so that means that, and that. So this is like a physical, a physical effect. A physical. This is the physical reality. Right. So that means that um, now this number here is the probability or probability density of measuring some some property. It means that that the wave function must be uh, written in such a way or constructed in such a way that it, that it does not introduce a bias in, the, in this experiment. It does not introduce a bias towards one particle or another in this experiment. It must predict that the, the probability of particle one being detected here and probability and probability of particle two, sorry, probability of particle one detected here and particle two there is exactly the same as probability of particle one there and particle two there. It cannot introduce any bias towards one particle ending up in, in, in one, one detector. It's got, uh, the wave function must preserve the indistinguishability. So, what that means is that the wave function must have this property, and, and I just, in this kind of um, like poetic license, if you like, um, this notation, um, if the wave function where, I've written down the wave function where the properties of particle one, um, um, uh, this, the properties of particle one, particle two, are uh, mixed up in a certain way. If I swap the particles, if I swap the particles, if I rewrite the wave function with the particles swapped, particles exchanged, then and this is the wave function that results. Then the modulus square of that has to equal the modulus square of that. So this. To get to this wave function, you start with the wave function you write down initially. If you swap the, the, the particle, the pair of particles, then you've got to get exactly the same probability. If this is true, then the wave function hasn't, uh, it hasn't introduced any bias. You cannot tell that the particles have been swapped just by looking at the modulus squared. What is the definition of psi over here in this case? It's just the wave function for the two particle system. Okay. So the modulus squared will give the probability of measuring a particle. Um, what we're doing here is measuring um, the put say some some property of two particles at the same time. Some, but not necessarily probability. Oh no, we here here it's a probability measurement. Mm -hmm. Well, what you know, when, when you when you, um, this is an experimental measurement. It's an experimental measurement of, um, say, position, because you're detecting the particles there or there. Then whatever the wave function is, you construct the wave function saying, oh, let's say arbitrarily the particle one is, is, uh, is this symbol, particle two is that symbol, and write down the wave function somehow. Of both, of both particles. Oh, for both particles, for the entire system, because the, yeah. the wave function must describe the entire system. Yeah. If you swap this pair of particles, yeah. this modulus squared has to be exactly the same. Okay. Yeah. So, but the two particles are identical, right? Yes. This is the case, identical particle case. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this condition here um, is essentially um, the mathematical notation for what's going on here. What, what this is telling us. So we have a many body wave function that's psi. Yep. And there, will there be two single body wave functions as well? Oh, no, not necessarily, no. But if you have identical particles, actually, th and, no, that's a separate question. What we're going to find out now is based on this condition, 
what are the and well, what form does the wave function have to take? That's what we want to find out. Now, if you have an n body, uh, if you have n, a system with n identical particles, then this lack of bias has to be true for, for any pair of particles. So if you so you just so this has to be true for but when you swap any pair of particles, in fact every pair, one at a time. You have to you have to swap every pair of particles. No, not in fact. But you'll see, you'll see it later. But the main idea is that the wave function does not introduce a bias towards any particle. Um, and this is going to be called permutation symmetry. Now, what we'll, what we'll actually see is that, um, now, this is a condition, this is an equality of real numbers, but psi is a complex value function, which is based on two complex numbers, in psi is a complex number. So in fact, um, that equation will impose two possible structures, if you like, or forms on the wave function. It will impose two forms. This equation imposes the, the, the forms of the wave function. And we'll prove that only two structures or forms are possible. And the wave function for a system of n identical particles must select from one of these in order to preserve the permutation symmetry. And there are no exceptions. But first of all, uh, before I just go on to that, I want to just briefly mention the Hamiltonian for the system of n identical particles. Um, the observables, because the particles are identical, they are interacting with each other, say pairwise, in exactly the same way. And any observables have to have to appear in the Hamiltonian symmetrically. Now, this word "symmetrically" in this case, when I'm talking about the Hamiltonian. Uh, means that um, the Hamiltonian is invariant if you permute any pair of particles. So for n identical particles, the Hamiltonian must be invariant under permutation of any pair of particles. So for example, if, for, uh, if you have two identical particles, one possible valid Hamiltonian is uh, P1 squared on 2 n plus P. There's a kinetic energy, okay? And um, then, so if you swap the particles, then the momentum of particle two will go there, the momentum of particle one will go there. These are obviously that would, uh, would have had it in the same form. The interaction, the pairwise interaction, is, depends on just the, um, the distance between them, yeah. and in this valid Hamiltonian. And the interaction with the external field each, each particle ex, um, interacts with some kind of external field independently of the other. That's what that means. So this is just one particular Hamiltonian uh, which has permutation symmetry and is suitable to describe N, uh, two identical particles. Now, if you define an operator that permutes particles, then clearly after operating on the Hamiltonian with the operator, if you permute two particles, the Hamiltonian remains the same. So the Hamiltonian is invariant under permutation of the um, particles, but we know that we can write that in terms of the um, Actually, we haven't done it yet in terms of commutators. Yeah. We've done it in terms of um, Poisson brackets. But we haven't done the permutation. We haven't like we haven't written commutation as. Uh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, so do that. Um, 
in an exercise 10.35. Um, I mean, one argument, one line of argument would be start from the classical Hamiltonian, um, define a permutation operator for particles, um, and then the Poisson bracket com um, commutes with the uh, Hamiltonian. Therefore, is a the Poisson, mm -hmm. the, the permutation operator is a conserved quantity in the classical case. In this case, um, it's, you're going to get that the expectation value of the um, of the permutation operator is a conserved quantity. What that means is if a state starts off with a particular permutation symmetry, then it retains it forever. It never changes. That's what that means. So the Hamiltonian makes the, the causes of development or time evolution of the of the system and the particular symmetry of the system never changes. This could you explain it again? The, the fact that uh, when the, ham the, the, the formulation operator is, is conserved. So, yeah. so what does that imply? We did the symmetry implies conservation. In mm -hmm. So if, we, if, if the permutation operator leaves the Hamiltonian invariant, yeah. It's like as a, the angular momentum operator. Mm -hmm. If it leaves the Hamiltonian invariant, it means yeah. it's the it's a conserved quantity for rotation for example. Yeah. So it's, this one is a conserved quantity for this motion, this uh, this flow. So, so at any point, um, the the permutation symmetry will hold. Yeah. That, that's what it means. The, the it's conserved. The, the, the exactly that type of permutation symmetry. Whatever the permutation yeah. symmetry yeah. the yeah. system yeah. starts off with, will it will always have conserved. We will be conserved. We will never change. Okay. Yeah, that's explored more. I think in um, exercise ten point five point three, ten point three point five, one of ten point five point three. Okay, so just as a summary of what I've just said, uh, the origin of permutation symmetry of states for a system of n identical particles is the physical fact that when wave functions for different identical particles overlap then it is impossible to distinguish which is which, both in the past and the future. Secondly, the experimentally measurable quantity is the modulus of precise square. There are exactly two kinds of permutation symmetry, uh, because the modulus of precise square is a real number, but psi is a complex number. This is something we'll actually show um, in, in, about, in a minute. And the third thing is the permutation symmetry of the Hamiltonian means that the Hamilton permutation symmetry of the state is a constant of the motion. But doesn't this uh, kind of contradict what we said in the first lecture that uh, state space doesn't overlap? So if it's impossible to know what happened in the, in the past, it means that there was an overlap at some point, like we said here. That's only deterministic, right? Yeah, so it's not deterministic. Yeah, it's fine. But it's probabilistic. Mm -hmm. At any point, there can be two paths. We're not talking about part, we're talking about quantum systems, not mm -hmm. classical systems. So the idea of paths doesn't make sense unless you talk about the expectation value. Okay, so there are exactly two types of permutation symmetry, and let's show this now. So <coughs> This follows from this equation here, this, the fact that um, the wave function cannot introduce a bias towards any particle, which means if you swap this, a pair of particles, this probability doesn't change. So Let's start with uh, two non-identical particles, just for, just for a second. Um, call them particle A and particle B. And suppose we have a complete set of commuting observables. Um, and um, let the, let the uh, operator omega be all of these at the same time, A, B, C, D. So we're measure it, making maybe several measurements at the same time of many observables. And there's the same observables 
but um, uh, we will observe each particle um, uh, with them at the same time. The corresponding sets of eigenvalues, uh, let's say A1, B1, C1, D1, etc. for particle 1, and this whole set of eigenvalues, which are the results of the measurement, um, are going to be, I just call it this bowl 1, and the results of the measurement for particle 2 are this bowl 2. So this is a Two, one and two are just a set, just sets of eigenvalues that are um, the results of the measurement. Now suppose we make a simultaneous measurement on both particles and measure two sets of eigenvalues. Uh, since we can tell in the non-identical case which particle was measured by which detector, we can say that the state immediately after the measurement uh, is, let's say, this ket and we'll put both numbers in this ket, 1, 2, where the first, where the one mentioned first, we'll just say arbitrarily is, let's say, particle A, and the one mentioned second is particle B. So the particles are distinguishable, and uh, we are confident, in fact, we know that immediately after the measurement, this is the state of the system. Um, right, now suppose we do the same thing with two identical particles. But the problem is we can't know which particle is measured uh, with, with which set of eigenvalues. Because you don't know which, what, what entered the detector, which particle went to the detector. Immediately after the measurement, we cannot know if the state is 1, 2, or 2, 1. So quantum mechanics tells us that if some process can occur in two different ways, then a system state must be a superposition of both. So we'll call this superposition, let's put it as a ket, psi, and just have it as an argument of psi 1 and 2, we want to know the relative phase of the components of that superposition. So there's that component in the superposition and that one. We want to know their relative phase. But one thing we can tell immediately is that if, that if the particles are swapped, which means that if the, this set of eigenvalues appear here and this set of eigenvalues appear here, then according to the uh, experimental condition before, equation star, the permuted ket must give exactly the same probability as the original ket. Probability. But you know that if two states give the same probability, then they can be different from each other, or that they are, they are, they are different from each other only by multiplication of a complex number by a complex number of unit modulus. Yeah, Professor? Yeah. Why are the observables different for the non-identical particles? As in, why are they different? Why do we name them with one or two? Wouldn't they be the same? No, because we know, the, the point is that we know that this set of observables belongs to particle A and this set to particle B. We know that particle A entered this detector and particle B into that detector for the non-identical case. So we can we know that for sure that the state after is this one. But we don't. But with the identical case, we don't know what the state is after. It can, it can either be one or two or two one. We don't know. Because what if we apply a one b one c one some omega one yeah. to particle two? No, no, no. Well, well, this is uh, what the, the kind of measurement that we're making is a combination of omega 1 and omega 2 simultaneously. So this is like, uh, this, this is an operator for particle 1 if i equals 1, an operator for particle 2 if i equals 2, and the operator that is actually operating on the wave function is a certain uh, combination of omega 1 and omega 2. So both at the same time. Measuring both at the same time. Uh, but it has to be the same combination for one and two or different combinations? 
Um, essentially, my question is how do we, how can we tell the distinguishable just by the by the operators? Oh, had, had, if in the in the distinguishable case, yeah, in the non identical case. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, because. Um, um, Because you know that um, well, maybe one particle is higher mass. Okay, so the de the de detector or some measurement device tells us some some value, and we know that from from before that this. Should have this one. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we know that there's a say helium atom and hydrogen atom in there, okay. or helium atom and lead atom. Okay. Yeah. Oh, professor, yep. Why do we need to put the the, uh, the alpha con uh, complex constant? Ah, because you know that if if one way function. If the modulus squared of one wave function equals modulus squared of another wave function, then, then these two wave functions, they're not equal, but they, they can be different by a number of unit modulus. So e to the i theta, because, then, because that there is psi a star psi a, or psi b star psi b, equals e to the minus i theta psi b star um, e to the i theta psi b that cancels and that's psi b star psi b um, in fact I can put an a there mm, the second one yeah there 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 so basically, they are exactly the same, except for uh, a number of uh, a complex number of unit modules because of that. Yeah. So, so these so these are these are basically parallel states, except that um, there's a one well, they're having different length. Well, alpha is, is, it doesn't make sense to call it a length because alpha is complex, but um, they, are, they, are, they are dependent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dependent vectors. Okay, so that's one, one equation. But on the other hand, the operator corresponding to the sum of the measurements, okay? The sum of the measurements would be the operator omega 1 plus omega 2. Yeah. Um, that cannot be sensitive to the exchange of particles. If you exchange, exchange um, the, the particles, then this operator, that two, will, that two will go there, that one will go there, and that's just, or, that's just um, ordinary plus. Plus is commutative. So it's the same. And um, the result of the measurement is 1 plus 2. Now this plus, now this is for eigenvalues. Actually for plus, um, in fact, um, yeah, for plus, uh, even for operators, even for operators, uh, plus might have a special definition. You'll see it um, could be addition of angular momentum, as we'll see next semester. So plus might have a special definition. Um, so, but whatever plus means for a particular observable, plus is always commutative. So two, the result 1 plus 2 equals 2 plus 1. But the thing is that the eigenkets of this operator there are two eigenkets. You see that operator acting on this ket 
gives 1 plus 2, that operator acting on this get gives 2 plus 1, but 1 plus 2 equals 2 plus 1, and the same eigenvalue. Degenerate. It's degenerate. Twofold degenerate. So th these two eigenkets of this operator give the same eigenvalue, 1 plus 2. But that means that the wave function, the state vector for the two identical particles, must be a superposition of these two. It must lie in the two-dimensional eigenspace spanned by these two eigenkets. And in general, we would like to write that the, the state ket, state vector, is beta times 1, 2 plus gamma times 2, 1. You just write it like that. Where beta and gamma are complex numbers. Some linear combination of that. And you see, that has to be beta because that's not normalized. Well, we'll see. But that gives us a second equation. So let's see. Um, we combine it with this condition, the cap psi 1, 2 equals alpha times the permuted where the particles, the same the cap when the particles are commuted. So that means that that there, psi 1, 2, beta 1, 2 plus gamma 2, 1, equals alpha times the same thing with the particles commuted. Particles per permuted. That's beta 2, 1 plus gamma 1, 2. But now you've got beta 1, 2 there and alpha gamma 1, 2 there. You've got gamma 2, 1 there and alpha beta 2, 1 there. The ket 1, 2 is independent of the ket 2, 1. So beta equals alpha gamma and gamma equals alpha beta. So you eliminate beta. There's beta. So beta equals gamma on alpha. Gamma on alpha equals alpha gamma. So alpha, alpha squared gamma equals gamma, which means alpha squared equals 1. So alpha equals plus or minus 1. And gamma is plus or minus beta. If you go back there. It's just by convention, put beta equal to plus 1. As you can see, as you'll see, it doesn't make a difference. Put beta here equal to 1. We could have done that straight away, but here you see you've actually got a choice. Put beta equal 1, then um, gamma is plus or minus 1. So putting it all together, so gamma is plus or minus 1 there, and alpha is plus or minus 1 out here. So basically what that is saying is that the two, for two identical particles, the state ket can only have the form 1, 2, plus 2, 1, or 1, 2, minus 2, 1. I have yeah. a query sure, so on the previous page. Mm. When you say that you have your beta omega 1 plus omega 2, mm. uh, why does that give 1, 1 plus 2? Because there would be a cross term. Right? Sort of. Because we, have, we apply the operator on the... Oh, no, no. Um, the, way, the way this... I haven't defined um, the, the, the notation of how this operator is meant to act on that. Oh, okay. okay. Well, what that's what's supposed to happen is that that operates that operates on, on what's mentioned first, oh, okay. and that operates on what, what's mentioned second. Okay. Yeah, that's that, in fact we're gonna that that's part of what we're um, going to do later on. Uh, the definition of a complete and commuting overload is that 
for any for for the basis of the function of the cat space, we have uh, we have an eigen basis with that's not degenerate, right? Um, no, not necessarily. It's it's uh, a community set of observables. A complete commuting set means that all the possible uh, results of the experimental measurement are represented as eigenvalues. Yeah, and, and all the results are different, right? Sorry? As in, when we, when we represented it, if there was any degeneracy in one of the, uh, in one of the operators, mm. we, we, need, we needed uh, the, the complete set of commuting of the rules such that there's no degeneracy. It becomes just a diagonalized Oh, yes, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, how yeah. come that we only have two eigenvalues, one or two? Or, like... This is a set. A1, B1, C. Yeah. So, this means that we only have two, two possible results for the entire cat space. No. This, could, this, this stands for a large set of numbers. Okay. Each one of those is a large set of numbers. So this is all the eigenvalues that can be taken by cat one. Yes. Yeah. So even though individually the but, but this is all the eigenvalues that can be taken by what's on the left hand side of that yeah. cat. So the, the, the position in here is important. Because even though individually the it's a commuting set, we still obtain some degenerate. That's in the plus or plus? In, in the plus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, because these these are single part operators. Yeah. Okay, so this combination is called symmetric, and this is called anti-symmetric. Uh, to normalize them, you multiply by 1 over square root of 2. All right. Um, now, this is uh, a generalized kind of notation for any uh, set of uh, observ observed values from an experiment. So it's important to realize that the system wave function must have exchange symmetry with respect to exchange of particles. Keep that in mind. That means exchanging all the labels in the wave function that refer to each particle. So you're exchanging particles. So the system wave function for more than two or more identical particles must be either totally symmetric or totally anti-symmetric. Totally, totally symmetric means any particular, any pair of particles, when, if you permute any pair of particles, you end up with a plus sign. The wave function but ends up with a plus sign here. Psi 1, 2 equals plus 1 times psi 2, 1. Or totally anti-symmetric, which means that psi 1, 2, if you swap the particles, if you swap, swap one pair of particles, it swaps with a minus sign. You get a minus sign out the front. But the important thing is it's totally symmetric or totally anti-symmetric. So, um, Okay, so based on the connection between um, mathematical theory and experiment, this psi squared, this um, modulus of psi squared being... Um, In, when we were deriving the, the one for alpha and gamma and beta values, yep. we wrote that alpha squared is one, yep. and then we went to alpha is equal to plus minus one. But alpha is a complex number. So we wrote that 
alpha squared is 1 mm. and alpha is equal to plus minus 1. Yeah. But alpha is a complex number. Yeah. So mm. it can be a phase. No, no, it's squared. There are only two roots for the squared. What do you mean? There are only two, it's squared, not multiple squared. Z squared is equal to 1. So what are the roots of the square root of 1? It's either 1 or minus 1. Yeah. This is. There are, the root, there's a unit circle in the complex plane. <coughs> what you're saying is the modulus square. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, 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 the roots of, oh, the, there's okay. one there and there's one there. Okay. If this was alpha cubed equals one, there'd be three equally spaced around the unit circle. So, um, so the, but the real question is, how does a state choose between symmetric and anti-symmetric wave functions? The answer is given in a huge theorem for quantum field theory called the spin statistics theorem. So symmetry, the connection between symmetry and statistics. Um, um, first, the totally anti-symmetric state vectors are only associated with half-integer spin particles, the fermions. Have you heard of fermions before? Bosons? Have you heard of bosons? Totally symmetric state vectors only describe integer spin particles, bosons. Okay. So you can't derive that from quantum mechanics. Okay, now, Pauli exclusion principle. A typical situation, and this is an illustration of the point I made here about totally symmetric and totally anti-symmetric. A typical situation is a particle with spin and one spatial degree of freedom. So, the total wave function is the it is a product of the spatial wave function and the spin wave function. And in the X basis, in the position basis, uh, the, um, the, the spatial wave function is a function of X1 and X2. And the spin is a function of the Z, the projection of, um, the Z projection of each individual spin two particles. In more, in, this is the in function form. In more abstract notation, we could write that the ket psi 1, 2 equals the ket psi x1, x2. And there's this uh, direct product, um, chi, this here is chi, which in English is pronounced chi, uh, um, which is a function of that. In the anti-symmetric case, we must have that the total, psi total, oops, that if you swap the, if you write down the, if you write down the ket, and it's anti-symmetric, you've, you've properly anti-symmetrized it, well you can check if you've properly anti-symmetrized it, because if you swap the particles, you must end up with a minus sign at the front. But to get a minus sign at the front, to be totally anti-symmetric, if you have two parts of the wave function, the spatial part and the spin part, the spatial part could be symmetric, and a spin part could be anti-symmetric. The spin part, the minus sign, could come from the from the spin part, or the minus sign might come from the spatial part. So the spatial part might be anti-symmetric, and the <coughs> spin part might be symmetric. You have only these two poss possibilities. You have these two possibilities. Um, now, there's a spin, what's called a spin singlet state, state and a spin triplet state. 
which seems to have been zapped. Somehow it hasn't been Um, two electron, like I said, if, if a particle is in a spin singlet state, spin singlet state is anti symmetric, and then two, and then if the, if the two electrons, uh, which are fermions, are in a spin singlet state, then the spatial part of the wave function can be symmetric. And if it's symmetric, then they can occupy the same point in space. But if the particles are in a spin triplet state, then they cannot occupy the same point in space. The probability of finding it vanishes because in this case, the spatial wave function alone must be anti-symmetric. In other words, the spatial wave function alone, if you swap the particles, they must swap with a minus sign. So you must have the property that psi of x1, x2 equals minus psi of x2, x1. Then if x tends, if x2 tends towards x1, and let's call it x, then you get psi of x, x equals minus psi of x, x. Well, that can only happen if psi of x, x equals zero. But if psi of x, x equals zero, then, that, then the probability of finding particle one in the little cube around x1, and particle two around an infinitesimal cube around x2, which is that, is gonna be zero. So the spatial part of the wave function must have a node if there are two electrons that have the same spin projection and, and energy. But then they occupy the same point in space, so x1 and x2 have power the same x. Yeah. yeah. It seems to be a page missing. Yeah, there's an anti-symmetric spin state. Okay, so let's go, um, so, um, um, so let's, let's call that one, two. And chi of two, one, is to swap the particles. If you swap the particles, it means that that, that label goes there. That label goes there, and that label goes there. But that is minus of one of the square root of two. That, that, minus, that, oops, that, which equals minus of chi one, two. And so, that is an anti-symmetric spin part of the wave function. And then they can occupy the same point. Right, so, so now the, the total wave function is a product of the spatial part I call it a direct product in a direct product space and chi one, two that. And now, if you have two electrons, you've got to have, um, must have psi total be anti symmetric, totally anti symmetric. Which means that if you swap psi two, if you, psi total, if you swap the particles, you have that.
But um, if this, you have now a choice that either this is symmetric and this is anti-symmetric, or this is anti-symmetric and this is symmetric. Now, if the if you're talking about two electrons and they're in a spin singlet st state, this is a spin singlet state. That one there, it's called with a minus sign. It's called a spin singlet. I mean, opposite spins and a minus sign. It's a spin singlet state. Um, then it's anti-symmetric. So. In fact, this is this would have to be a symmetric spatial part, which means that if you then that equals this without a with the times of mod, times of plus one. In other words, it's the same. But here you get a minus sign coming up. Like that so you get minus all of that, which is minus psi total. One, two, so that's properly anti-symmetric. So first we need the con so the condition from spin statistics is that the total wave function is anti-symmetric yeah. for four for you know, fermions here. Now the electrons could be in, in the spin triplet state. So they spin triplet state trip states. Uh, um, so chi one two in our notation. So this is has, this has to be symmetric. Um, is if um, up up or one on root two up down. Plus down up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, yes, that's right. That's right. Because the spin projection has to be plus one, zero, or minus one. That's right. Yeah, that's it. These are the three spin triplet states. Okay. Yeah. So you so you see that if you swap the two particles, that label goes there. That label goes there. That doesn't change. That label goes there. That label goes there. That label goes there. That label goes there. And that doesn't change. In the spin single state, uh, so th 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 does that mean that the spin portion mm -hmm. must be uh, anti-symmetric for for a spin singlet state? That's the um, it, you, we you you have no rational reason to to understand that yet, but. Next semester, when you when we learn additional angular momentum, how to add spins, then you'll see that it has to be this. It has to be anti-symmetric in the spin singlet state. Yeah. Right. So total symmetry and total anti-symmetry. That's a very important point. So now. So the, if the spatial part of the wave function is anti-symmetric, then that means that the two particles cannot occupy the same point in space because of an argument like this one. But beware, even fermions can occupy the same point in space if they are in a spin triplet, a uh, spin singlet state. Spin singlet, spin singlet, spatial, spin singlet means spatially and uh, spin anti-symmetry, spatial symmetry. Yeah. yeah. So make sure you get the, those two. All right. Um, so that's the so the Pauli exclusion principle refers to quantum states specified by um, so the energy, which is the principal quantum number, or orbital angular momentum quantum number L 
magnetic quantum number ML, which is a projection of the orbital angular momentum onto the z-axis, spin quantum number MS, which is a projection of the spin uh, angular momentum onto the z-axis, and any other quantum number. The Pauli exclusion principle states that two identical fermions cannot occupy the same quantum state simultaneously. Now that, uh, you need to think about. Uh, you can derive it, it's not really deriving it, you can um, okay. see, you can, uh, um, show that it's consistent with what we've done. For two identical fermions, psi total of 1, 2 must equal m minus psi total of 2, 1. Um, now let uh, the, the, the 2 be 1 sort of thing, so the particles be identical. Or, or, or uh, I mean, in the same, exactly the same state, have exactly the same set of sets of quantum numbers. Psi total of one one equals minus psi total of one one, which means that psi total of one one equals zero. But that assumes that the, these four quantum numbers uniquely identify uh, a state, as in there's nothing else that they can change. Yeah. That's why we have a complete commuting set of observables. So these are the complete computing set. Yeah. The computing set yeah, yeah, that. yeah. 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 But we assume that one from A to something like a, lo a large number of computing sets outside of all the observables. Now just just four. Yeah. Just now it's just four. Yeah. If you have this is for two identical fermions. For n identical fermions, consider the exchange of any pair. Then then um, this just generalizes straight away. Anyway, summary. For identical, identical fermions must be described by totally anti-symmetric wave functions, which means that exchange with a minus sign, exchange any pair of particles with a minus sign. Identical bosons must be described by totally symmetric wave functions. So if you exchange a pair of particles, the, the, you get a plus one sign outside the wave, wave function. Okay, the concept of bosonic and fermionic wave functions why do we talk about that? Because the total wave function may be a product of different types of wave functions, spatial wave functions, spin wave functions, for example. Okay? So we can think we can talk about fermionic wave functions. For example, the spatial part, the spatial wave function, spatial part of the wave function uh, may be anti-symmetric. Is if it's anti-symmetric, then 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 uh, the spatial part is a fermionic wave function because it's anti-symmetric. So we say fermionic is associated with anti-symmetric. It doesn't mean that this only describes fermions. Bosons can be described with this wave, this spatial part of the wave function. The total wave function must be symmetric for bosons. How do you make a total wave function symmetric? Symmetric. symmetric times symmetric or anti-symmetric times anti-symmetric? Bosonic basically means symmetric. So for example, the spatial part of the wave function, if it's symmetric, then we call it a bosonic uh, spatial part of the wave function. Um, in these, in the spin singlet state, this is a this is a fermionic. Fermi, people, people call this fermionic um, um, spin wave function. It just means that it's anti-symmetric. Um, this the spin spin triplet states are symmetric. They call this bosonic. People call this bosonic. Okay, even though it can be used to to describe fermions. All right. Professor, yeah. what do you mean by uh, the wave function space anti-symmetric or total is anti-symmetric? Oh, now, now so totally anti-symmetric means yeah. the total wave function is usually a product of, say, a spatial part and a spin part. Okay. Yeah. And for fermions, if you, this, this total wave function, if you swap the two particles, if you swap a pair of particles, you must get a minus sign out the front. 
But how would you get a minus sign at the front if it's a product of these two parts? Well, either the minus sign comes from there, and a plus one sign comes from there, or a minus sign comes from the spatial part, or a, and a plus one sign comes from the spin part. So either the spatial part is anti-symmetric and, and the spin part is symmetric, or the spatial part is symmetric and the spin part is anti-symmetric. Okay. Okay. So for uh, the Boson equilibrium function, yep. um, we can say that uh, the uh, spatial, uh, sorry, the spin wave function can be uh, un uh, symmetric as well. Ah, now, when I say bosonic wave function, we're referring to either that or that, but not that. Oh. It's just another way that you, see, that you read about in textbooks and, and in, in the literature of, of referring to symmetric or anti-symmetric parts of wave functions. Part of a wave function. So, yeah. This is the total wave function. This is a part of these are parts of the wave function. For fermions, that's going to be totally anti-symmetric, which means that either symmetric times anti-symmetric or anti-symmetric times symmetric. Okay. And and if this is symmetric and that's anti-symmetric, then that's called a bosonic part, and that's called a fermionic part. But this is etc. Okay. Yeah. You'd be amazed how many textbooks get this wrong. What I'm doing now. Right. Okay. All right. So. Good. Okay. Now, generalization to n-identical particles. Um, just to start off, but suppose we have um, four particles and we order them like this. Just uh, particles, just put them uh, particle one, particle two, particle one in slot one, particle two in slot two, particle three in slot three, particle four in slot four. Just order them like this. Now, randomly choose any permutation of these particles. Okay, four, two, one, three. Right. How many exchanges are necessary to get from there to there? Exchanging a pair of particles at a time. Well, for example, you can go one, two, three, four, and then the first one you can swap one and four. Then you go four. Then you have four, two, three, one, and then you swap these last the the, the ones in the, in the last two slots. So you get four, two, one, three, and you finished. So you needed two. You needed two exchanges. Yeah. Okay. Now let P be the number of exchanges that you need for a permutation to to achieve a particular permutation. And you define minus one to the power of p. Call that the parity of the of the permutation, not of the state. Different, different. It's permutating parity of the permutation, not a state. This is our a combinatorial thing. This is a combinatorial problem. So the parity of the of this permutation. So this is a permutation. The parity of this permutation is minus one squared, which is plus one. So it's even. So it has even parity. Now you may well ask, are there any other ways of of permuting these? Um, permuting these, maybe there's a different number of permutations that you need. Maybe there's a path from here to here with a different number of permutations, and actually. Um, there isn't. There's a, and you can prove it. There's a theorem from combinatorics, right? And it, so there is an algorithm uh, for calculating the parity of a permutation, and it's based on a. In fact, it depends on topology. It depends on writing down the permutations on a two-dimensional piece of paper. 
So, you have a perfect, let's say your original configuration was one, two, three, four. You write down your target configuration up above it, and you join join the the particles with a straight line, four, four, three, three, two, two, one, one, and you count the number of intersections. So, one, two, three, four. Obviously, um, even if they, if you, even if they all join at a point, intersect at a point, you count them separately. Four. Four is an even number. So, if there is an even number of intersections, then the parity is even. Otherwise, it's odd. Anyway. So it relates to the exchanges, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. But, if the parity is even, then you need an even number of exchanges. And then for fermions, the overall phase factor is um, plus one. What's this mean? Because then you need to get the minus. So if you exchange something and exchange it back, it should be the same. Thing. Yeah. Sure what I mean by that. Anyway, this p hat is called an exchange operator, and it just means that if you have particles in this order, one, two, three, four, in, in these slots, and and you have any, and this permutes these particles in here into any single permutation. So here, that permutation is a result of P operating on, on this um, n tuple. If there are bosons, then any permutation is plus one because um, it doesn't matter. You swap any pair of particles and you always get plus one out the front of the wave function for bosons. Yeah. So bosons, it doesn't matter. Bosons is easy. But for fermions, it depends on the parity. So if you have a permutation with parity P in there, then you have to multiply that wave function by minus 1 to the P. Because you need a P pairwise permutation exchanges to get to that permutation. And if P is odd, then you get a minus sign. If P is even, you get a plus sign. So if you uh, exchange two pairs of particles, two pairs of fermions, you get a plus sign. If you exchange three pairs, you get a minus sign. Um, so, and actually I shouldn't be talking about fermion, okay, fermions, bosons, yes. So for, and it's the same for fermionic or bosonic parts of wave functions. Maybe I should say parts of wave functions. Yeah, parts of the sum, sum total wave function. But doesn't that mean that two electrons can occupy the same uh, point with, with the same spin, but three can? Yeah. So three electrons can occupy the same point. Let's see, three electrons. Um, guys, because then the wave function would be similar. Well, you've yeah. got it has to it has to obey this. The to, it has to be for for fermions. The wave function has to be totally anti-symmetric. No. Um, you got to check it out. Make up a totally, okay, maybe as an exercise. Write down uh, a totally anti symmetric uh, 
uh, wave uh, wave function or, or wave function for three particles. Or, or just um, um, a fermionic. Part. So in other words, ignore spin. If you say, this is simpler, this one here. Or just a fermionic part for three particles. Challenge. Which is asking, there would be six states, right? Yeah, for fermions. So you would have to choose the negative side that is called. Yeah, so, so basically, um, whatever, say it's a fermionic thing, so say maybe, so maybe uh, um, yeah, you, you'd have say x1, x2, x3, you have to have all permutations for fermions or fermionic pipe, all permutations of x1, x2, x3, you just have to get the minus signs right, minus and plus. Yeah, so x1, x2, x3. Um, minus x2, x1, x3, so I've just swapped the first two, so there's, a, there's only one, one pair swapped, so that must be a minus sign. But the next pair swapped, let's say x2 and x3, would must be a plus sign. And then, um, let me see, yeah, it's, yeah you just gotta, you gotta do it systematically. Etc. Mm -hmm. You have to do it systematically to get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Not completely, not completely trivial. This stuff. It's actually quite, you know, quite challenging. <clears throat> okay. Just to. Let's let's have some concrete example of a of a of a problem, right? Like a, something that we can do easily. So we have n identical particles in a box. Let's just say they're not interacting, and there are, and there are no external forces. So the Hamiltonian is just the sum of the kinetic energies, right? Very simple. If it's in a box, then there's no potential. Right. Yeah, yeah, particle in a box, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of isolated system. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, particle in a box, so by definition it's uh, the, the box potential. It, it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, the box potential. So we know that the wavelengths are discretized, and the wave numbers are 2 pi and lambda, k equals 2 pi and lambda, and the lambdas are discretized, but they're discrete. Um, the product state is um, just choosing. Uh, you don't want a product state. You don't know what a product state is yet. Yet, but we'll find out. We'll find that out in a few minutes. So, first of all, um, a single product state. Just take an arbitrary um, ordering to start off with. K one, K two, K three up to K n. So, K one is the wave number of the first particle. K2 is a wave number of the second particle, etc. So this is just to start off with. Um, particle 1 has energy h bar squared k1 squared of, on over 2m, etc. Okay? So that's our state. But it's, it's not a state that can validly... This state is not valid for n identical particles. Well, didn't we see the, oh, as in why is it discretized, the wavelengths? Because they're in a box. So, it's a box. But then... Particles in a box. But didn't we see that only when there's a infinite potential are there some modes? Yeah, that's the box. But there's no potential, and if, if it's a free particle... No, it's, 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 um, it's the... It's uh, the walls, total... The, uh, the, the elastic box. reflection on the walls. Inside the box there's no potential. Inside the box there's no potential, but at the walls there, there's an infinite potential. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now this, this wave, this cat here, cannot, uh, it, it, is, it cannot represent, validly represent, um, 
and identical particles. But anyway, let's just move on for a second. So in the X basis, this basic, what we call product state, is, is the projection of this onto the X basis, um, which is a product of over all the uh, our, um, particles of these eigenkets. So these are the momentum eigenkets, basically. Psi, K, alpha, Type x alpha. So notice that alpha, the alphas here are the same. So each to each factor in the product refers to a single particle. Now that happens because the particles are not interacting. So the Schrodinger equation separates into single particle Schrodinger equations. And the many body wave function factorizes into a product of a single particle, oops, product of single particle wave function. Okay. So the particles move independently in the sense that they do not interact. But if they're fermions, then the fermionic, or if they have spin, then the fermionic spatial exclusion uh, still causes and causes correlations or anti-correlations. Okay. If 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 you had to describe the system um, with fermionic spatial wave function. Um, the eigenvalue equation is the n particle Hamiltonian acting on, um, on this ket equals the energy times this ket, which is a sum of all h bar squares k, k alpha squares on 2n. But so these, this product state uh, satisfies this eigenvalue equation, but the product state does not have de definite symmetry. It does not have permutation symmetry. If I swap particle 1 and particle n, it's a completely different state. So this is not suitable. So, so in other words, uh, it, it, it cannot, this cannot uh, validly represent n identical particles. But wouldn't it have the same eigenvalues? Or the sum of eigenvalues? Yeah, but that's not the point. Some of the eigenvalues will be the same. Yeah. But you would not get, for example, Pauli exclusion principle. So this is wrong. In fact, um, yeah, in this case we get the same. Yeah, but okay. Um, if this wave function, if this wave function, uh, okay. In fact, this doesn't have definite symmetry, so it actually gives the wrong predictions for an experiment for n energies. Okay, that sort of contradicts what I just said. If, if the particles are fermions and two of these k alphas are equal, then this product wave function will give some positive probability that two particles are located at the same point in space. In other words, you can put a detector there and actually, well, this predicts that you can put a protect, protect, uh, detector there and, and measure that these, two, that these two particles are there, but that's wrong if they're fermions. So this doesn't uh, give the Pauli uh, um, power exclusion principle. This is wrong. How, how is it wrong? So we take two, uh, two particles. This is not properly symmetrized. 
This is a single product kit. But if these are identical particles, then it's impossible to tell which particle has K1, or which part, K, say K1 is up to K, and are some definite values of, 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 of Ks. We cannot know which particle is which K. But if you have a ket like this, this says that particle 1 is that, particle 2 is that, particle n is that. That assigns certain k's to certain, to, to certain particles. But that's wrong. If they're identical, it's impossible to do that. So it'll have to be a superposition of... Of, of, of this and all permutations. Yeah. All distinct permutations. However, it would be valid for a uh, for a distinguishable particle. For yes, if they're distinguishable particles, um, then you'd have different masses or something. Yeah. So then it's perfectly valid. It's it's perfectly valid for distinguishable particles. Yes. Okay. Now, what we need to do is to normalize the wave function somehow, or you need to write it down what it is. It has to be properly symmetrized, anti-symmetrized, and you need to normalize it. So how do you do that? Well, the fermionic state, and for the fermionic state, we'll just put a ket with all the k's like this and put a minus sign there. And this is just supposed to represent um, an anti-symmetric an anti um, state. So, it's a theorem. The form and normalization of fermionic and bosonic states. So first of all, the normalization for the fermionic state will be 1 over square root of n factorial. Right? And then the form of the, uh, of the actual an properly anti-symmetrized state is the sum over all permutations minus 1 to the parity of the permutation times some permutation of uh, times, the, times the permutation of the, these k's that you're talking about. For bosonic states, where you see these kets with a plus sign, you're going to have the normalization 1 over square root of this n plus is this n plus, you'll see what it is in a minute. And then, but here it's very simply, you just have all plus signs and all possible permutations. So for bosonic states, this part here is easy. You just have all permutations of, here of the k's and just add them up. But the normalization is a little bit complicated. 1 over square root of n plus where n plus is n factorial times the product over n k n product over n k let's see n k factorial there's a factorial missing here it's got to be n k factorial n k where each k, if each k appears n k times. So k1, the value k1 appears once. Then that's one factorial. k2 appears twice, and you've got to have multiply again by two factorial. K3 appears three times, three factorial. Yeah. You can kind of see where this comes from, as you, you see it in a minute. Right? Now, the fermionic case is easy because every possible permutation must be present in here. Because if you make n simultaneous measurements on n identical particles, then it is impossible to know which particle was measured in which detector. And in fact, it's the same for bosons. But there are n factorial permutations. 
So the normalization is 1 over square root of n factorial. Okay. So for, for um, the fermionic state is easy. Um, now, this, now this part here is just the uh, parity, the, the overall phase factor that you get if you have a particular permutation here. This very useful, this is a very useful way of, um, um, or, or very useful thing to remember, that um, the spatial wave function in the X basis for free particles, of the spatial wave, fu wave function gives you um, the normalized fermionic wave function. The slater determinant, sorry, gives you the normalized spatial wave, fermionic spatial wave function. 1 over square root of n factorial times the, de times the determinant of psi k1 of x1. Now in this column is particle 1. This, this column particle 2. This column particle n. The eigen, eigen functions for particle 1. Psi k1 at x1, psi k1 at x2, where's it? It would be the other way around. Other way around, yeah. Pa right. Particle 1 is at x1. So psi k1 of x1, psi k1 of x2, or psi k1 of xn. So the same k's are down here. And then that, there's that. So that generates a properly anti-symmetrized. It doesn't matter. I don't, I don't think it matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so this generates the um, what you want. If you have non-interacting particles in the box, then these psi k's are square root of two on L sine k alpha x j. Um, so. Uh, and then you see this, you just have um, that. So this is the former normalization of the fermionic state. Um, and note that if you look at the determinant closely, you'll see that each of these K1, K2 up until Kn have to be different. If they're not, then the determinant is zero. So that means that this, the state doesn't exist, which is part of the exclusion principle. This is, this is a great way of understanding the power of the exclusion principle, at least one aspect of it. Okay? If you have, let's say if you have a 2 by 2 matrix, you have psi k1 x1, psi k1 x2, psi k1 x1, psi k1 x2, the determinant is zero. So this 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 function equals zero. It's power exclusion principle. Its state doesn't even exist. You cannot have the same quantum numbers, two particles with the same quantum numbers, if they're fermions. That's a nice thing. Um, for bosonic, okay, and just just before proving the bosonic case, let's just see how this works. Um, for n equals 2, fermionic case, k1, k2, and before I used to have a minus sign there. So the formula says sum over all permutations of minus 1 to the parity times a um, permutation of k1 and k2. Um, this doesn't have to be minus. And 1 over square root of 2 factorial. So that's 1 over square root of 2. And so it's minus, so it's what the identity permutation is k1, k2. So that's minus 1 to the 0, do nothing. And then it's minus 1 to the 1 because you have one exchange. What's that? In the x basis, you have k1, 
K1K2 projected onto X1, X2. And that means, well, as we'll kind of see later, that means that 1 over square root of 2 is, well, that equals 1 over square root of 2, psi K1, X1, psi K2, X2, minus, you swap the, um, you, you either, you keep the X1 and X2 there and there, and you swap the Ks, if you like. Like that, psi K2, psi K1, like that. Which is just the slate of determinant. And that's anti-symmetric. The, the particles are fully entangled um, in a sense that you'll really appreciate later, but it's as if the, you've got a particle at x1 and a particle at x2, or some other particle at x1 and some other particle at x2, but they come in these pairs, and, and it's like every possible permutation exists in each of these products, each of these terms. It, every, like, all the permutations of k's and x's exist in each product, each term. It's, it's uh, completely entangled. And obviously from this, if k1 equals k2, then, then uh, that wave function equals zero. In the bosonic case, say for n equals two or n equal particles, K1, K2 plus is the sum over all permutations of the permutation of K1, K2 times 1 over square root of N plus. Let's suppose that K1 is not equal to K2. Then N1 is the number of times that K1 occurs, which is 1. It's obviously just 1 factorial. And N2 is um, 1. So N plus is, is 2 factorial times 1 factorial times 1 factorial, that's 2. So the normalized wave function is 1 over square root of 2. The identity permutation, k1, k2, plus, because it's a boson, or bosonic, and then the permutation, k2, k1. In the x basis, project it to the x basis, um, you would get, um, that's, that goes with that, and that goes with that. So the position is important. That goes with that, that goes with that. The position is important like that. So that's psi of sub k1 x1, psi of sub k2 x2, and the other permutation for that. Okay. And that's obviously symmetric and what's well, also entangled. Um, okay, so in both cases, the two identical particles are in entangled states. We'll appreciate a lot more about that in the next couple of lectures. How is this made manifest in an experiment? So let's have a look. Let's calculate the probability density that a particle will be found at x1 and the other particle will be found at x2 simultaneously assuming that K1 is not equal to K2. So that probability that we want to calculate is the modulus squared of the wave of the of the of the fermi of the fermionic wave of the symmetric or anti-symmetric spatial wave function. Okay? So what are they? You have a choice of either Psi S or, or Psi A, which is which is this one here. This one. So that's got a minus sign there, that's got a plus sign there, but otherwise they're exactly the same. Otherwise they're exactly the same. So the modulus squared is is this, there it is there, this plus and minus. Coppets conjugate times itself and so that's this complex conjugate times that which is the modulus of that squared plus this 
complex conjugate times that, which is the modulus of that squared. So this is psi k two x one, psi k two x one, psi k one x two, psi k one x two. So that's the modulus of that squared. And the half comes out from um, the fact that it's one over square root of two times one over square root of two. But then you have the complex conjugate of that times that. And the complex conjugate of that times that. So you've got these cross terms. Now let me just write, uh, okay, so that's just um, psi k1 star of x1 times psi k2 of x1 psi k2 um, psi k2 2 star of x2 times psi k1 of x2 star. and you got now now there's a plus or minus that comes out the front that is plus or minus that that comes from here now here this is psi k2 star of x1, psi k1 of x1, psi k1 star of x2, times psi k2 of x2, well, you get that, and there's plus and minus coming from there, so we just factorise the plus and minus. Now this here is called the interference term because if the particles were distinguishable then all you would have is this this term here without a half if they were distinguishable all you would have is this but if they're indistinguishable, you have this extra, you have this real number, this real number, this section, real number two. You have plus or minus this, but whether it's plus or it's minus depends on if you're talking about bosons or fermions. If x1 tends to x2, then the anti-symmetric part, that the, the anti-symmetric probability goes to zero, as you can check, if you put x1 tends to if you put x1 tends to x2 here, you have you just check that you'll get zero. But if you get the bosonic case, what happens at the same point x put, put the same point x? Look at the interference term here. You get half psi k1 star x, psi k2 x, psi k2 star x, psi k1, psi k1 star. Um, but that there is just this psi k1 x, psi k1 star x, and that's psi k2 x, psi k2 star x. So that's just modulus of psi k1 x, psi k2 x, all squared. And that's a, that there is the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So you get one times, basically half times that plus half of the same thing. So you get one times that. But at x1, that adds on to this term here. So in fact, you get double the probability density of finding the particles at that point. It's right there in front of your eyes. Look, it's right there. The probability density is doubled if they're bosons and zero if they're fermions. Okay? So they don't stick together? The, the bosons like to stick together. <laughs> right. 
Yeah? Constructive interference causes doubling of the probability density relative to the distinguishable particles case, where there is no interference term. Yeah? It's right there. Okay. Um, so, bosonic states, so constructing fermionic states is easy. You simply find all the possible exchanges systematically, multiply each term, each term by minus one, um, minus one to the p, um, and uh, multiply each time, okay? Every exchange you multiply by minus one, divide the result by square root of n factorial. For bosonic states, you have to find all the permutations given that several of the k's might be the same. Then divide the result, resulting sum by the square root of the number of distinct permutations. It's basically it. The number of distinct permutations. So, I mean, you can look at this example yourself, but basically what happens with, with the bosons is that um, suppose you have you have K1, 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 K2, K2. In other words, particle 1, K1, particle 1, particle 2. Um, so in other words, you have all, all of those the same. Uh, um, let's say you need to construct um, a symmetric wave, symmetric. Um, if you have three Ks the same and, and two Ks the same, then, if you write down all the permutations of this, one, two, three, four, five, five factorial permutations of this, do you have to divide by three factorial and two factorial to get the distinct ones? That's basically all that's happening. Yeah. The other thing is that that when you when it comes to normalizing it, when it comes to normalizing it, um, um, you get. Um, Five factorial too many there, five factorial too many there. Well, so some number, so not five factorial, some number of um, too many there. So you have to divide by, um, and you have to actually divide by, by this. Why is it n factorial times this product and not divided by n factorial? It's because it's because, uh, I mean, that's a, like a tricky point. Um, all the permutations give n factorial squared in the products, but the thing, and n factorial of these contribute one, and the rest contribute either zero or one. That's, that's, that's really what's going on, if you think about it. Okay. You can think about that for yourself. It's a little bit. A little bit tricky, a little bit advanced, but um, I certainly want you to be able to, to do, say, this one here. Uh, this is, uh, you can try to understand this as well. But certainly be able to construct, say, um, a, a symmetric state for three, uh, for, for, for uh, three, partic three identical particles. We have two two eigenvalues the same and one different. So all the distinct permutations are alpha, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, alpha. And so all you have to do is go to one over square root of three times all the possible some of the possible permutations. That's an easy thing to do. Yeah. So you have to write down all the all the distinct permutations if you're talking about bosons and bosonic wave functions. And we didn't we didn't do the same thing for like we didn't take two common case for fermions because it was trivial in that because case. because the state disappears for power exclusion principle. Yeah. Um, this is an example. You don't have to read this if you don't want to. Um, but um, yeah. okay. So what have we got? I think that it's time. Well, it's certainly break time. Um, so I've gone pretty slowly with that. That's okay. The second part is, is very straightforward. 
Um, so what I might do is we might have a, like, a 10 minute break and, um, and I'll go through this. It, it's going to go quite quickly because it's, it's very straightforward. Okay, let's, let's finish it off. So it's just combining quantum systems. We'll just uh, start, off, start this off uh, today. Um, so one thing you need to uh, get clear in your mind is the difference between the direct product and the direct sum. So if I have a direct product of two vector spaces, what does that mean? And if I have the direct sum of two vector spaces, just check that out in, in Shankar chapter one um, at, you know, at your earliest convenience before next Monday. Um, and okay. Um, so let's, let's suppose we're interested in a two particle Hilbert space. The eigenfunctions uh, eigenkets of the position operator are obtained from this equation and the set of all of these forms an infinite dimensional orthonormal basis in Hilbert space and a cartoon picture would look like this but you know you can't really draw axes like this because you know it's a complex value in, in general it, it's complex value in the sense that uh, the basis isn't uh, if, if you, you you can change the basis by unitary um, change of basis and and rotate it so you can rotate into some complex plane in here and, and you can't draw it anymore. Um, but uh, anyway, consider two particles that are described classically by position and momentum x one p one or x n x two p two. The rule for quantizing the system is to promote these variables to quantum operators and uh, these will obey the canonical commutation rules and so the and there is a correspondence between the classical Poisson bracket or the Poisson bracket and the quantum mechanical commutator and it's this uh, that um, the quantum mechanical commutator xi pj is ih bar times the Poisson bracket of xi with pj which is ih bar delta ij the delta ij is a chronic delta so what is the small xi small pj? Um, that's that's a Poisson bracket so these are um, position and momentum classical position and momentum variables there, there is a there, there's a direct correspondence between the Sorry? It's in the time, the, the, the correspondence. Oh, good. Okay. We'll, we'll actually establish this from fundamental principles uh, in QM3. Uh, sometimes uh, you don't actually need to work in a particular basis. You can just extract all the physics using the canonical commutators. Uh, but usually you need to work in some basis, such as the coordinate basis. And the combined system lives in the combined Hilbert space formed by the direct product of the single product Hilbert spaces, single particle Hilbert spaces. For two particles in 1D, the coordinate basis consists of what we're going to be called product kets. Um, and the, the definition of a product ket is you get a ket from the first Hilbert space and a ket from the second Hilbert space and you, and you, and, and you sim the direct product of them is this and this, the order matters. Uh, a, a simpler notation for it is to leave out the, the cross or the circle symbol. So some textbooks have that. Uh, Shankar also, and many other textbooks, just uh, have a single ket with two, the two eigenvalues, x1 and x2, in like that. And you can also leave out the comma, if you like. So these are four notations for the same thing. We'll use this one, this one, and this one. What this means is, uh, you know, we, uh, I'll investigate that later. All right, so if we want to be careful, uh, then we denote the domains of operators with a superscript. Uh, one, cross, one cross two for an operator whose domain is some subset of the combined Hilbert space. One for the operator whose domain is a subset of particle one's Hilbert space, and so on. So for example, uh, the product kets x1, x2 are simultaneous eigenkets of these two operators. Now, x, the x1 operator, whose domain is the 
the uh, some subset in the combined Hilbert space, and it's defined as x1, the x1 operator whose domain is some subset of the first particle Hilbert space, um, crossed with the identity operator acting on the second Hilbert space, the second the other Hilbert space, and x, this this operator is the x2 operator uh, whose domain is uh, uh, in the combined Hilbert space. And it's uh, the identity operator acting on the first Hilbert space, vectors in that first Hilbert space, cross the X2 operator acting in the second, on the second Hilbert space, like that. How, how, what's the action of these operators? So let's say you have X1, uh, whose domain is in the whole of the Hilbert space, in the combined Hilbert space, acting on the eigenket X1, X2. Then um, this, by definition, is x1, 1 crossed i2. And so what happens is that x1 acts on, this operator acts on what's on the left, what's on the left hand side here acts on what's on the left hand side here. What's on the right hand side here acts what's on the right hand side here. So that's just x1, 1 acting on x1 crossed the identity acting on x2. So that just keeps the identity acting on x2 just gives x2. x1 acting on x1 gives the eigenvalue x1 um, times that x1. And so that's just x1 times the, the same eigenket. Okay? So that's just formally, this is what you've been doing formally, like for, for the whole semester basically, whenever you had more than one particle, whenever you had more than one dimension for a single particle. That's what you've been doing. <coughs> Actually, so this is just formalizing um, the case where you have one particle in more than one dimension, or more than one particle in one or more dimensions. Just formalizing. Okay, um, the normalization for the position product kets um, is given by this relation here. And it's just a product of delta functions. Uh, each delta function is for one of the position variables like that. Um, and in this basis, the ket psi, uh, it, when it's projected onto the, the eigenkets, position eigenkets, is a function of two variables. Yeah. And the operator xi in the, X, in the position basis uh, goes into the position variable xi and the operator pi in the position basis goes into minus ih bar on d by d xi where I, I here is a subscript for the number of particles. You got n particles, so i equals 1 to n here. And this i is a complex i of course. <laughs> and then um, the quantity, if you take the modulus of this function of two variables squared, then that just is interpreted as the absolute. It is just a probability of finding particle one near x1 and particle two near x2. Okay, as long as psi is normalized. And dimensionality of the tensor product space, the, the space you get when you do this operation for two vector spaces is called a tensor. It's going to be a direct product space or a tensor product space. The relationship with tensors may or may not be emerge by the end of this, in the next two lectures. But yeah, it's, it's related to tensors. Anyway, for each, um, for each ket in V1, well, there are an infinite number of those, and there are an infinite number of basis kets in, in V2, position basis kets. And the tensor product of the two, the dimension of that um, is the dimension of each space times is the dimension of one space times the dimension of the other space. In the case of the position bases, um, it's just doubly infinite. Um, other bases are possible, of course. You can get the momentum bases for simultaneous eigenkets of momentum operator on P1 and momentum operator on P2. Or, you know, it could be, you could have any other um, um, eigen, eigenvalues here of some op operators, omega 1, omega 2 are functions of x1 and p1, x2 and p2. Um, 
Now, as with the uh, now, uh, mum, 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 PC. Okay, don't worry about this for now. We'll do this next week. Definition. This is just what I what I what I said a few minutes ago. The direct product of two operators. Now, this is just straight from Shankar. Um, gamma one from the first Hilbert space. Lambda two from the second Hilbert space. With this is yeah, it is denoted by that with the, the direct product of that or tensor product of that and it acts on the direct product get that in a way that I've just described. I'm not gonna do it again. And this is just the same as before. Uh, many textbooks don't bother with the explicit notation. Okay? So for example, one thing you, you probably have seen before is the um, is the center of mass kinetic energy operator. So the, the kinetic energy of the center of mass is the momentum of the center of mass squared divided by two times the total mass of the system. If there are just two particles in it's M1 plus M2. Um, so that's P1 plus P2 squared over 2M. Um, now that's P1 acting, which is, which is um, from the Hilbert space. The domain of this operator is really the Hilbert space um, associated with the particle one. It didn't mean, well, this is related to the operator that acts on particle one, and this is related to the operator that acts on particle two, but its domain is, is the whole of Hilbert space, um, as you'll see in a second. The P1 plus P2 squared, uh, because P1 and P2, um, they commute because the domains are from different um, Hilbert spaces, uh, P1 squared plus 2P1, P2 plus P2 squared. So, um, so if, you, if you just look at that, you might wonder, well, hang on, how come P1 and P2 commute? Uh, well, you know, yeah, you, know, you might ask, you know. Well, the reason is the domains are different. Again, again, it's the domain that, that, that matters, yeah? And um, see what that really means is what that 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 squared thing here means is um, it's uh, p one squared, but the domain of the p one squared operator is is a subset of the whole team, whole combined of space, and these the domains of all these are sub uh, um, uh, combined Hilbert spaces. But if you look at each of these separately. This is this is um, originates from the. I mean, the basic idea of this operator is that you want to only operate on the um, particle one from the first Hilbert space. So you construct that operator to be P one, whose domain is one, and you cross it with the identity, and the, the so it doesn't affect the second Hilbert space at all. And it, whereas this one here, P two. Um, is the other way around. It doesn't affect the first particle at all, but it um, it it, it, it um, measures the momentum of the of the second particle. And you see, the domains of these two operators are completely different. In in a sense that well, no, they're the same because they're one cross two, but uh, but you see that some, somehow they are they are mutually exclusive in their action. They act they they act only on 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 on, on like complementary parts of the combined Hilbert space, so they obviously commute. Okay, so when you write it out like this, these obviously commute. So sometimes it's, it's, it's very useful to be very clear about the domains of these operators, of many particle operators. Okay, that's the point of, of what I'm trying to make. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, evolution of the two particle state vector. Um, this is straight from Shankar as well, so I'm not really adding anything. I just want to mention it, and you can probably read it yourself. Um, so the state vector psi is an element of the Hilbert space, which is um, the the, uh, the direct product of two Hilbert spaces for the separate particles. The time evolution um, is given by the, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation I h bar, and this is supposed to be the time derivative of, of the Kep psi. There's a Hamiltonian um, for two particles 
is acting on psi. And there are two classes of problems. Either the Hamiltonian is separable or the Hamiltonian is not separable. Separable means that, um, that, that you can write all the, uh, all the variables pertaining to each particle um, as, as separate terms. So this is bread and white plus sign, and that will eventually lead to a separable partial differential equation. So they're non-interacting. Yeah, it, it, right. In this, if it's if H is separable, if, if they are non-interacting, then H is separable. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <coughs> so um, not separable. Then it means that um, now we're not talking about charged particles here. Uh, if you have charged particles, then you have. Well, um, velocity dependent forces, etc. So don't worry about that. But the potential energy uh, for not separable particles that are uncharged are um, so, uh, or we don't care about the charge, is um, the potential energy, which is a function of x1 and x2 in general, does not separate into a product of two um, v of x1 times v of x2. It does not separate like this. Right. In other words, the Hamiltonian does not separate into a sum of two single particle Hamiltonians. Right. Um, so um, now you can read you can read this part yourself. This is a stretch from Shankar. Um, this is just basically method of separation of variables. If you if you can't remember what it is, then just read this. It's, it's about time that you were aware of it. Yep. In the class B, H is not separable. Separable. Yep. yep. Uh, v of x one comma x two not equal to v x one. These are different functions. The, the v's on the left and right are different functions. Yeah. 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 Um. So this is the separable case. Blah, blah, blah. You can you can just read this for yourself. Um, now, um, well, something that that you should you need to know. And which is very useful in later later on. Um, if you're going to um, if you're going to do any sort of calculations with scattering in say particle physics, or uh, um, you, you know, if you're going to yeah, so you're going to need the center of mass coordinates. Uh, so you need to uh, so here is the center of mass coordinate the definition. And there's um, if you have but let me just backtrack a little bit. If the Hamiltonian is separable, then that leads to a separable um, partial differential equation for Schrodinger's equation. Um, and so you have, it just becomes the Schrodinger equation for separate particles. This, is, this one here is for particle one, this one's here for particle two. If you had n particles, they would all be separable. And the total energy is a sum of the, sum of the single energies. That's, that's, that's what that would end up being. And then the, and the solution is, is very simple. Uh, in the other case where you have interacting particles, um, sometimes, um, actually usually, you would have a pairwise interaction like this one. And in fact, often you would have the absolute value of this, of the distance is, is what's important. Uh, what can you do in this case? If you have only two particles, and uh, and they they are uh, and they are interacting uh, pairwise like this. Then if you if you write the uh, if you use center of mass coordinates, then you can eliminate um, essentially one particle and uh, and basically reduce the problem from a two particle problem to a one particle problem. And the one particle problem that you, you solve for the fictitious particle. Which is which is located at relative coordinate that, and which has reduced mass uh, mu, which is um, uh, m one m two over m one plus m two. There it is there. So a two particle problem can be reduced to a one particle problem if you use center of mass coordinates. And actually, if you if you're using many body. Uh, um, yeah, usually with many body problems, you're using center of mass coordinates, even if you're just reducing the number of particles by one. Um, okay, so you can just read this bit here. Just be, just, just uh, know this because it's um, it's useful for the future. The Schrodinger equation then separates. 
the Schrodinger equation, the Hamiltonian separates into the center of mass kinetic energy and the kinetic energy of the fictitious particle. Um, and, um, and, then, and then what happens is that the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian factorize because the Hamilton, the, Schrodinger, the partial differential equation becomes separable. So it's you know, basically the same thing as before, except this time you've got a center of mass motion and a, and a fictitious uh, particle motion, a reduced mass mu. And so you have, um, you have what, uh, this, this will be useful for next semester. Um, basically it separates into two. Basically what happens is that the wave function for the center of mass, oh sorry, the wave function for the, the two particle system, the center of mass system and the reduced mass system, a reduced mass particle, center of mass particle, the, the fictitious particle at the center of mass and the fictitious reduced particle of reduced mass mu, they are at these two coordinates, so you've got a, a wave function of two variables. What's interesting is that the, um, the, wave, the part of the wave function that is due to the center of mass is just a plane wave. You get e to the i, uh, momentum of the center of mass divided by h bar times the position of the center of mass. That's what you get. Divided by the usual um, um, normalization for the plane wave. And then here, that's multiplied by the uh, relative, what's called the, the relative wave function, or the wave function of the relative motion. And the total energy is the energy of the center of mass plus the relative energy. Normally, um, you don't worry about the center of mass motion, and you're only interested in, in this part here. So if there's a bound state or something, um, if this is the part that, that tells you about the bound state, and the bound state, say, say a diatomic molecule or something, with dimer, will be moving at some momentum um, in the system. Basically, you forget, as it says here, you forget about the center of mass in, in quantum theory. Um, you just you just look at the uh, the relative coordinates and the relative energy. N particles in one dimension. Uh, that's just basically we've, we've something we've covered already. The last two pages you can read for yourself. Um, it's if you're, gonna, if you're going to be doing an exercise. Uh, 10.3.5, yeah, 10.3.5, uh, where you're going to uh, investigate the consequences of that anyway. So I'm not going to do it now. The, you, you get a pair of numbers from your from your measurement, but you don't know which particle get, belongs to which numbers. Yeah. So you get the, <coughs> the sets of eigenvalues. Yeah. And you don't know which one belongs right. to which one. Yeah, yeah. Don't know. yeah. And and thus you don't know the operators because we we label the operators. Oh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you don't know which operator was acting on which one, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Well, but but the op the operator is that is represent is represents the detector. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, you don't know which operator uh, registered which uh, which uh, eigen which particles eigenvalues. So that amounts to the same thing. Yeah. All right, so that will do for today. And so next week we'll get into entanglement. And next week will be a lot from Suskin too. So it'll be, it'll be pretty straightforward. But um, it's, you know, we'll be getting into entanglement and another one of these quantum, a quantum effect that will challenge your uh, 